Enzymes can be inhibited to prevent them from doing their job. For example, enzymes that allow for DNA replication. You only want them to work at certain times and not all the time, otherwise you'd be wasting resources to create products that are not needed. If you buy a vacuum cleaner, do you keep it on all the time? No, obviously not. By convention, the topic of enzyme inhibition tends to be undertaken as primarily a categorization exercise. I will use another approach to explain the key ideas behind enzyme inhibition. In the following few checkpoints, we will be discussing the characteristics of enzyme inhibition. First, before we talked about the broad categories of enzyme or the types of enzyme inhibition, which will be saved for later. So how does an any inhibitor at all inhibit an enzyme? Well, we know that the main enzymatic action of any enzyme catalyzed reaction happens at the active site. So there are a few ways that the reaction can be inhibited. For example, I could block the active site so that no substrate can bind there. I could also modify the shape of the active site to prevent binding of the substrate. But in order to do any of those actions, we, the inhibitor must first form bonds to the enzyme, resulting in reversible or irreversible binding. Whether an inhibition is reversible or not depends on the type of bond that is formed between the inhibitor and the enzyme. If the bond form is a weak bond, such as hydrogen bonds, or non-polar or dipole interactions, the bond can be broken easily. Hence, this form of inhibition is termed as reversible. But if the bond form is a covalent bond, which is, if you recall from chemistry, is a much stronger bond due to the sharing of electrons, then the inhibition becomes irreversible as it is nearly impossible to break this bond to restore enzyme function. So now we know that an enzyme inhibition can either be reversible or non-reversible.